Welcome back to my review of A Conscious Universe by Armando Calvo. We've looked at chapters 8 through 10 and then circled back and looked at chapter 1 as well. And now we're on chapter 2, Nature Praises, which sounds like it's about trees praising God or something. He starts off talking about, well, trees praising God, because their branches point up and they look kind of like arms. Notice how each branch grows its own two sets of branches, like a pair of arms, as if the trees are giving praise to a higher being. Now, when I said that title sounded like trees praising God, I was joking but I don't think he is. The simplicity of how nature responds to the light, heat, and energy of the sun demonstrates the praise and worship we humans display towards the ultimate energy and life source. So, to clarify, the ultimate energy and life source of plants is apparently the sun, and so they worship it, or at least Almando thinks they look like they do, while they scramble to compete with each other for limited access to this resource, sunlight. The structure of trees, the reason they're so tall and have branches to increase leaf density, is oriented around competing over light, to get this energy before something else does. And this mirrors humans' worship of our energy source. What is this source? Well, going by the analogy, it's food. That's the energy source that our lives and bodies are oriented around striving and competing for. Now, I don't think that's what he wanted me to take from this, but it's the only thing that makes any sense to take from this. But so the rest of this chapter will be Almando's attempt to answer these questions. What is it about all of creation giving praise to an ultimate source? What purpose or goal is the universe trying to achieve? Can you guess what his answer is? Of course he can, but let's pretend this isn't painfully predictable and see what he has to say. What we're going to talk about now stretches from pages 23 to 30. It doesn't need to, because there's only one relevant point made in the entire thing, which is that plants, animals, and humans, humans of course being non-animals to Almando, need light, water, air, and nutrients to survive. But it's hard to write 140-ish pages, double-ish spaced, and so he needed to stretch this out. A lot. We'll see a lot more of this going forward. So he has a whole section dedicated to plant life and what plants do with all that light and water and air and food slash nutrients. The only reason he's included the debatably applicable word food alongside nutrients here is to make it line up better with the animal and human sections. He starts off plagiarizing two sentences from a PDF he found on Google somewhere, which states explicitly that it's intended as learning material for children. Here's the plagiarism comparison, and notice that the original sentence reads, the relative importance of each of these needs differs widely among plants. But he's changed it to the relative importance of each of these elements differ widely among plants. Apparently now there are multiple importances. It's like he's adding grammatical errors on purpose to make it sound more like his writing. Interestingly, the PDF lists five vital needs. Light, water, air, nutrients, and proper temperature. He just discards the fifth one because who cares, and then keeps on referring to four vital needs, 23 times in total, if my count is correct. Across those 23 references, he can't seem to decide whether he should use the word for or the digit for. The word for is slightly in the majority, so that's good. He also can't seem to decide what to call these things, so he seems to randomly choose a word every time. His choices include elements, principles, essentials, values, and components, and sometimes he'll throw in a modifier like basic or standardized or important. He probably heard somewhere that you shouldn't use the same word over and over in writing, but the point of that is advice is to encourage you to improve your writing style, not to do whatever this is. Anyway, his point is that the fact that chemistry requires inputs is somehow inconsistent with an unintelligent cause. I don't know. He doesn't say why, he just says it like it's obvious and moves on. Or at least I think he does. His writing's so bad that I kind of have to read the claim into it a bit. It's not clear. And these four principles seem to show dominance in necessity. A random unintelligent cause would have to have lined itself up in a specific direction with a purpose-driven motive to emphasize such necessity. That's supposed to mean what I think it's supposed to mean, right? I don't know what else he'd meant it to mean. Now he sorta kinda cites the PDF he just plagiarized. The way he wrote this citation doesn't mean a whole lot unless you get lucky on Google, but at least it's something. But he's not citing it as a source for what he's already said. That was clearly presented as his own work, and thus was clear plagiarism. No, he's giving this source now for the next page and a half of material, which is presented in italics, which he uses to indicate that it comes from this source. I really don't understand the half measures I keep seeing in this book. 
Why would you plagiarize from a source, only to then cite it at the end of that same paragraph, and then quote a bunch of material from it that you indicate is from that source? At that point, why plagiarize any of it? Or if you're gonna plagiarize any of it, plagiarize all of it. Why does he insist on stopping just short of doing things right? He seems to understand the concept at this point, so I can't just attribute this to ignorance. It's weird and confusing. Speaking of weird and confusing, here's his text versus the original source. There are a bunch of meaningless little changes here that make these quotations incorrect. Again, if you're already doing it, why not just do it right? After the almost quotations, he claims that these needs of plants show order, goal, and purpose, and then explains how those needs show each of them. For all three, order, goal, and purpose, the reason is progression. It shows order because there's a recurring progression, and goal and purpose because there's a progression of plant life and survival. You might ask what he means by this, but I doubt there's an answer. He does clarify slightly with regard to purpose, though. Without a purpose, we would only see random results, not consistent ones. And his justification for that is nothing. That's the end of the section. Okay. Onto the animal life. So of course this section is basically just a repeat of the previous section with the same exact point. As I said, it's pretty obvious that this whole thing is here just to pad out the length of the book. Gotta make it worth that 30 fucking Canadian dollars. Unlike the plant section, here he cites no sources, despite the sections on the first four elements still being italicized. I get why he italicized the plant ones. He cited a source, and then he wanted to indicate that that was coming from that source. Now, little spoiler, all of this also comes from somebody else's work, but he doesn't cite anything, so if he wasn't planning to cite anything, and was just planning to commit rampant plagiarism, what was the point of italicizing it? To emphasize the plagiarism? Anyway, the section on how light helps animals survive is plagiarized from two places. Here they are. Let me pause for a second so I have time to show them. Okay, that's enough. He said that vitamin D deficiency will cause animals to just die. A bit overdramatic. The water section is plagiarized from two places, one of which is a site for children. The air one is also plagiarized from two places. And the food part is plagiarized from a site, again, for children. For some reason, he changed this is how animals get energy from food to this is how animals get the specific energy they need from eating food. Why? What's added by adding the words specific and eating? Anyway, he sums all this up with Animals, just like plants, need these four standardized principles to survive. So far, it seems like these laws were put there for a reason. Not random, not a coincidence, and definitely not by mistake, but for a reason. Um, yes, there's definitely a reason why animals need to eat and drink and breathe, yes. The reason is incredibly obvious, but what's his justification for this? Nothing, because the section just ends, and then we skip three quarters of a page for no discernible reason, and then we're on to the human life. So as you might expect, the human life section is not all that different from the animal life section. But there are a couple interesting bits in the opening paragraph. These four values could not be coincidental for the support of life. I know. He appears to have completely missed the point that his opponents don't claim that this is a coincidence. The fact that the sustenance of chemical reactions requires correct chemical inputs is the furthest thing from coincidence. It's not a coincidence that you have to keep adding fuel to a fire. Your campfire doesn't just coincidentally happen upon needing, say, wood for fuel instead of steel and rocks. To assume random, unintelligent adaptation is to presuppose some sort of direction and goal that life is striving for. Which is literally the opposite of what that presupposes. These two sentences, this one and the one about the four values not being coincidental, appear right beside each other, and each of them shows a different kind of total, willful ignorance of any position besides his own. But not only that, this one isn't even coherent. It basically reads as, to assume not A is to presuppose a. He claims he read this book before he published it, but I'm not convinced. Anyway, let's get into the four elements, by which I mean the plagiarism. The sunlight warms us part is plagiarized, and also has been plagiarized all over the internet. He took the full quote, but then he jammed provides us with vitamin D in the middle. Then he goes on a ramble about vitamin D, which is also plagiarized. 
this is such a pointlessly high effort form of plagiarism. I don't get it, like I thought the point of plagiarism was to be lazy, but Almondo spends so much time looking for a new source every sentence or two that it would have just been quicker to find something about the topic and then actually write the idea out in his own words. Why bother to plagiarize so much if the way you do it is actually harder than just writing a book normally? There's so much that Almondo does that I just don't understand. Anyway, the water section is also plagiarized, bullet points and all. For some reason he removes the italicization and the list formatting for the last paragraph of it, but that's probably just a screw up. It probably doesn't mean anything. The air section is stolen from the American Museum of Natural History. Well, the first half is, anyway. After that, he has a sentence about how we lose the ability to breath, which is easily Almondo original. He claims that oxygen gives us the ability to breath, and that without it, we wouldn't be able to have air intake. That is not what oxygen is for. That's what lungs are for, as is explained immediately prior in the sentence he stole from the Natural History Museum. So he plagiarized from them, but then he didn't bother to actually read what he copied, because if he had, he wouldn't have written this. And the entire food section is plagiarized from a description of a BBC show. And now, finally, Almando makes his point based on all this, which he could easily have done pages ago if he'd skipped the filler plagiarism, but never mind. What reason or purpose does the universe have that provokes life to arise and progress? Why is life important in a universe that has no intentionality on bringing forth life for any particular reason? And how did the universe figure out the needs for these four important elements that happen to support life? And why apply them to the three main sources of life, plants, animals, and humans? Now, there's a lot there. I could spend a few minutes on each of those questions, but I want to keep this thing moving, so I'm going to focus on the most interesting one, which is the last one. Its claims are so fresh and original. No, really, they are, because I don't think any other creationist would be dumb enough to make them. Plants, animals, and humans are sources of life, and in fact the three main ones, which leaves out the vast majority of the varieties of life. And it kind of reminds me of when he showed the variety of life by mentioning only lions, wolves, and bears. And the need for resources like air, water, light, and nutrients isn't intrinsic to these life forms by their very chemical nature. No, these three main life forms already existed without these needs, and then the universe simply applied these needs to them after the fact because reasons? Is there anything I can say to make it any more clear what the problem is here? Maybe, I guess, but does anyone but Almondo need me to? No, he is the only one missing the point, and he's not watching, so let's get on with it. He makes the claim you'd expect him to, that all of this requires a mind and intention, and so it's God and stuff, you know. And then he says that Jesus mentioned these four necessities. Wow! In fact, Jesus makes reference to these four important elements of life. Without the need for scientific observation and study, it seems that Jesus was right on point with the four basic necessities of life. Now, I can't be the only one who reads that to sound like it's saying that Jesus just noticed that air, water, light, and food exist. Which, of course, you would expect him to, assuming he had a more or less functioning brain and eyes. Has anyone in history without severe sensory disabilities failed to notice? this? Doubtful, but apparently this is impressive enough to Almondo for some reason that we're about to spend pages 31 through 35 going through Bible verses that show that Jesus had in fact heard of air, water, light, and food. This is another instance where a simple brief statement would easily suffice. In this case, something like, Jesus referred to air, water, light, and food numerous times. Maybe with like a footnote giving references to Bible passages if you really feel like you have to. But again, this is about quantity, not quality. Without the need for scientific investigation and the observation of life's necessity through years of tests, inappropriate semicolon, Jesus was perfectly accurate in his knowledge and referenced each necessity by applying them to himself as the source for life. This is the second time Almondo's implied that it takes some kind of deep scientific investigation to discover air, water, light, and food. Which raises the question, what kind of world does he think Jesus was born into? Does he think back then everyone was just cheerfully going around without breathing, or drinking or eating or leaving their basements. And then that damn Jesus came along and pointed out that this stuff is like super important though. And everyone went, oh, and then they suddenly realized why they felt all these weird feelings like thirst and hunger and suffocation. Gee, uh, how did we all miss this for so long? 
Now, I'm not gonna bother carefully going through the verses he provides. Obviously, it doesn't exactly strain credulity that a guy was quoted talking about some of the most basic stuff in life, and I'm not interested in pointlessly padding out my video with Almondo's pointless padding. I will mention a couple of funny parts, though. In the air section, he says that The next element that Jesus seemed to have full knowledge of is the necessity for oxygen. But then he provides a bunch of verses that, of course, in no way whatsoever mention oxygen, because this was 2,000 years ago, and Jesus, like every everyone else would have no clue what that was. In fact, they don't even mention air. They mention breathing. And to make it funnier, he bolds the parts that he wants us to focus on so that your eye is instantly drawn to the repeated references to breath and the complete lack of references to air or oxygen. Also, for some reason, Almondo refers to oxygen as the immaterial principle of oxygen, and that just made me laugh. At the end of the air section, he says, Jesus has laid down the foundation before us, declaring to us that he is indeed the breath in our lungs and the life of our soul. Oh yeah, there's also no mention of lungs in those verses. Interesting how accurately descriptive the Word of God had it before the scientific discovery of these four basic elements. Yeah, saying people breathe is accurate, but it's not descriptive to any unusual extent. It's exactly what I'd expect to see from a 2,000-year-old text. It seems to me that what Almondo finds impressively accurate here really has nothing to do with scientific knowledge. It's more like, Jesus said God is the breath of life, and wow, God actually is the breath of life! That's so accurate! Accurate! <sighs> In the food section, most of the verses don't refer to food exactly, but specifically to bread. Does Almando think it's impressive that Jesus knew about bread in a time when people ate bread? I wasn't impressed before his list of verses, and I'm much less impressed now. But Almando doubles down at the end, with a dichotomy so obviously false it belongs in a comedy sketch. Either Jesus was a scientific genius who knew about these four principles thousands of years before scientific observation and tests, or Jesus is the source by which we receive these things. Only a scientific genius would know that breathing and bread and water are good for you. Jesus Christ, Almando, there's no way you're this stupid. If the Bible was written thousands of years ago and these things were documented about Jesus, how did the writers themselves know about these four scientific observations? Without technology and scientific research, how could they conclude that these four principles are the four most important necessities to life? Uh, if you plant your plants in a cave or in a drought, they die. If you stop someone from breathing or drinking or eating, they die. Seriously, what the hell does Almando think the world was like 2,000 years ago? How does he think there were even people at all, if they didn't know how to breathe or eat? Again, we get a hilariously false dichotomy. Either we have scientific time travelers, or the writers are telling the truth, and Jesus actually said these things, making himself God and the source of life. And then he claims that breathing, bread, water, and light are scientific truths discovered thousands of years after his life. Thousands, plural, like two or more. It seems like Almondo's claiming that breathing was discovered around the year 2000. There is nothing I can add to that, and I think I'd just like to move on now, if that's alright with you. Okay, thank you. Apparently it's not only plants and animals and humans that praise God by breathing or whatever. Stars and planets do too. Amando introduces us to a young 27 years old astronomer named Kelper. I don't know if this Kelper guy had a first name or if he was such a rock star he only needed one name. Anyway, it doesn't matter what Almando says about Kelper because he stole it from this stuff on NASA about Kepler, and I'm not here to comment on NASA articles. On page 37, there's a picture he nabbed from NASA. Eh. Anyway, the point he wants to make with this is that he thinks the planet's following orbits undeniably points to a greater mind. The planets faithfully rotate around the sun as commanded to. What's his justification for this? Nothing. As usual. You're just supposed to believe it because he said it. But to me, this goes well beyond it just being unjustified. To me, this goes at least some way to justifying the opposite claim. Because it seems like the planets are dumbly following the warping of space-time, never deviating. And that doesn't seem to indicate that a mind is commanding them. It seems to indicate that one isn't doing that. Think about it. You see a ball rolling down a hill, following the lay of the land, you know, just rolling down the road where it's smooth and then bouncing off obstacles if they happen to be there, rolling faster down sharp curves and slower on flatter parts. All totally explainable by the nature of the ball and the hill, and of course gravity and friction. 
There's no reason to assume that ball is being guided by a mind. Nothing implies that it is being guided by a mind. What might start to indicate a mind in control, in the case of the planets, would be if those planets appear to move with no consistency or predictability. Not simple gravitational orbits, but roving around, changing direction despite there being no gravitational explanation at all. Or some other undiscovered scientific explanation, you know, some space equivalent to air currents or something like that. In the ball analogy, this would be like if the ball did not appear just to react to gravity and the texture of the hill's surface, but instead seemed to move just any random way, with seeming disregard for physics. That would not be conclusive, but at that point you might start to consider whether it's being remotely controlled in some way. That's how you already distinguish between passive toy cars and remote-controlled ones. The behavior of remote-controlled cars is irregular and unexpected based on surrounding conditions. And yet, for some reason, Almondo has this completely switched around. Apparently he thinks that the predictable, consistent behavior of a planet following an orbit, or a ball or a toy car rolling down a hill, is what implies a mind in control, and the unexpected and unpredictable behavior of a remote-controlled device or a fucking Death Star puttering around the solar system is what we should expect to see in a universe without a mind in control. And just in case you think I'm reading that into what he said, he clarifies that this is in fact what he means. Reliably remaining consistent without error. No planets colliding, no opposite rotation, no movement out of bounds, no inconsistencies with the time frames of every rotation around the sun, and no planets changing place with one another. Now, of course, to an extent, in our solar system, we do actually see some of those things. Uranus has a sideways rotation, asteroids still collide with planets, but happily the major planetary collisions are over with at this point in history. But the basic point is that planets stay in their orbits and don't just decide one day, you know what, eh, let's switch it up. Jupiter's gonna hop over to where Earth is, and Earth's gonna hop over to where Jupiter was. Or let's just slow down or speed up just for the hell of it. Or, you know what, let's get out of this damn solar system altogether together and head on over to Alpha Centauri for a change of scenery. Planets don't just move around by their own will, or anyone else's for that matter. They're just balls of rock and gas, stuck in an orbit. No different at all from a ball stuck rolling down a hill. And yet, that dumb, predictable behavior, with no sign of any intention in it at all, is apparently what shows that a mind is in control. And obviously intentional behavior would show there's not a mind in control. Somehow. Sure. Most of the final page of this chapter is just Almando saying how the heavens proclaim God, with a Bible verse here and there. Nothing special. But at the end, he says this, about the idea of a universe where God did it isn't the answer for everything. This is simply ludicrous! And I mean that with the deepness of its definition. It doesn't have an especially deep definition, so I'm not sure what he means by that. Probably nothing important, as usual. But anyway, this is right before the conclusion of the chapter, and it seems appropriate. It pretty much sums up what the whole thing was. This entire chapter was just a boring, overly padded, monotonous repetition of Elmando insisting that any ideas that aren't God and Jesus are just stupid. And everything he sees around him must be caused by God and Jesus because he said so. There's not so much as a hint of an argument to be found here. It's just look at the trees, look look at the breathing, look at the planets, therefore God, over and over and over. Somehow I found it even more annoying than most of the chapters I've gone through so far, and I'm glad to be done with it. And I say that despite having not covered the conclusion, but you know what? The conclusion is just a brief repetition of the same thing again. Stuff happens in nature, therefore God. Pointless, worthless blather that doesn't deserve a second more of my time. Well, thank you for watching. This one was a little bit shorter, but then again, chapter one was really, really long. That was a lot. So it balances out. Next time, chapter three. If you would, before you go, please do give the video a like and click subscribe if you haven't. And if you like the channel, also please consider supporting. Just a couple bucks a month or per video if you like helps a huge amount. And enormous thanks to all of my supporters who've already made that choice. For early access, email list, list.logic.com, and I'll see you next time.